welcome to Brawny Conversations. I am Patrick Braun, your host. This podcast will provide our listeners with informative and entertaining discussions held with experienced people covering a wide range of topics. If you want to shorten your learning curve or just learn more about one of our topics, this is the podcast for you. Enjoy our discussion. Meredith Moss is our expert guest today, and I know you are going to enjoy this conversation. Meredith and I will be discussing her recent experience as a competitor in the 2023 Ironman World Championships, held October 14th in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii. We discuss her background, training, equipment choices, race day, plus so much more. Learn how Meredith got started in Ironman and also how she balances career, family, training, and racing. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Brawny Conversations podcast, Meredith. Hey, Patrick. I'm so happy to be here. It's going to be a lot of fun today. You've got a great story to tell, and I am super excited to tell it. So before we dive into this topic, let's get some background on you. I think it's really important for our listeners to understand that you work full time in education in a leadership capacity, and you also have a family with a husband and multiple children. So tell us about your career and your wonderful family who supports and helps you in this crazy pursuit of Ironman greatness. Oh, goodness. You are absolutely correct. I, I lead a very busy life. Um, I am the proud principal of an elementary school in Klein ISD, uh, the greatest school district in Texas. Um, I have an amazing, <laughs> yeah, I had to put that plug in, right? Because I It is a good one. It is good. <laughs> I love it, though. I, I do believe I have an amazing school and I um, am blessed to get to do what I do every single day. Um, I have a great husband. He is um, him and my kids are my rock and they support all of the crazy that we're going to talk about today. Uh, my husband, Tim, and I have been married uh, for 18 years now and together for about 23 years. So a long time, long history. We have four amazing children. Uh, we have three daughters and a son, and we stay very busy but with all of their own sports and uh, high school band uh, for one of my daughters. So we, we definitely lead a very busy and nonstop life. Well, that's, uh, you've got to be a tight knit family to do everything you do. And, you know, I do f friends with you and I follow you on social media and I'm, I'm always amazed because I know the length and time involved in training that you're doing. And then I see you popping up at this child's event, this child's event, this school event, you're everywhere. <laughs> so okay. it's going to be awesome. We're going to have to talk about how you structure your calendar and get things done. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, Meredith, were you, were you an athlete growing up? What's your athletic background? So I, I was an athlete growing up. Yes. I, uh, starting from a very young age, like I can remember just playing on, on the block with the neighborhood kiddos, you know, in elementary school. And I was always very competitive as a child, uh, you know, street soccer, street baseball, just racing up and down the block, whatever the theme of the day would have been. My goal was to win. I wanted to beat all the boys on the block. I wanted to be better than everybody else. Um, so just very competitive by nature, which is kind of strange because my, both of my parents were not in athletics. You know, they were not, you know, sports driven. That was just something maybe I was born with. Uh, but I did start playing soccer when I was five years old and I played soccer through my senior year of high school. Uh, I did not go on to play college soccer, though. I kind of had other, you know, things in mind. I didn't want to continue to be so uh, dedicated and have to to work out and be at soccer practice in college. So that my college career did end or my soccer career did end before college. And, and what position did you play in soccer? Uh, I was left forward. All right. So that was my, you know, I just nonstop wanted to be back and forth up and down the field. And, um, you know, in hindsight, I, I definitely think it was my speed, you know, that kept me in that forward position because I could get to that ball. You know, somebody oh, sent, yeah. sent the ball. So are you, you left-handed, left-footed dominant? 
You know, the funny thing is I am not, I am, sure. I'm right-handed. So okay. I, I don't know why that, but my left foot was, that's where it was at. So, um, I love to just be the closer, you know, if the ball was sent up or, you know, if, if somebody missed, you know, a shot that they should have, I was always there. I was there to, you know, finish it off. That's so, very cool. I would not, I didn't know. So that's pretty awesome to find that out. Yeah, lots of fun. So I grew up in Lubbock, Texas and played, um, you know, for Monterey High School and uh, just lots of great memories on the soccer field. Very cool. Now, did you continue to do any athletics uh, like intramurals through college? I did not uh, kind of, you know, life took me down a different path and, you know, just working and hanging out with my friends. That was really my focus. Okay. Uh, kind of took a step back from athletics other than just going to, you know, the gym or, you know, doing little things like that. I continued to work out, but not at a, you know, any, you know, caliber that I am now or intensity and just kind of maintaining things. And I honestly, I didn't even start running until after my second daughter was born and she was born in 2006. Okay. Wow. So this really gets me interested because I've, you know, I've been out running myself and hear footsteps and see this redhead flying by me at seven thirty miles. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my gosh. So I'm sitting here going, okay, you haven't really been running in the, in the big scheme of things that long. So it's going to be fun to find out, uh, uh, where all that came from. And so, you know, we're, we're here obviously to talk about your experience in the Ironman world championships that happened in 2023. Uh, you earned your spot there. And now my brain's starting to spin around. I'm going, how in the world did you get interested in racing in Ironman? Cause that's not a, just something you just go, Oh, I'm going to do this. So tell us. It, I started as a runner. Once I started running after my second daughter was born, it was seriously just throw the kids in the jogger stroller and go on runs. And then, you know, that just kind of, that was my life for several years while the kids were little, uh, just running for fun, running with them, you know, riding on their bikes beside me. And then, you know, I started to run with a group in the woodlands and, you know, they all, of course, all ran races. And so I started to sign up for some running races and get into marathon running. And that's, that's where I started was, you know, running half marathons and marathons, both locally and, um, in different States. And that was always very fun. I think, uh, the second marathon that I ran ever in my life, I qualified for Boston. And so, and that was tunnel light marathon in Seattle. And how, how fast of a time was that to qualify for Boston? Uh, at my age at that time, I had to have um, under a three hour and 40 minute mark. My goodness. So, so I think, and, and funny story is my very first marathon I ever ran was here. In, it was the Woodlands Marathon. And I missed the 340 mark by one second. I finished in 340 in one second. And so, you know, of course, <laughs> when you're when you're qualifying for Boston in the grand scheme of things, you need a buffer time. That one second really didn't matter. But, you know, you, they take in everybody's time into consideration. So if your, you know, time limit is 340, you really need like a five minute buffer to actually get into Boston. Uh, okay. That buffer differs every year. That number changes. But the fact that I was one second away from that 340 um sparked something in me. And I was like, Oh, absolutely not. Like that's, that's not okay. So I seriously, a few days later, I was on the phone with my coach talking about the next marathon. What am I going to go race? Cause I have to qualify for Boston. Um, and that's when, yeah, I went to tunnel light marathon in uh, Seattle and that was a gorgeous marathon. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I think I honestly, off the top of my head, don't remember my time, but it was, you know, somewhere in that between 326 and, and 335 mark. So I got my BQ uh, and was on my way to my first Boston Marathon. Wow. Now, how many how many Bostons have you run? 
Uh, I've only been once, and I actually, I'll go back again this April, April 2024, for my second Boston. Um, after, after I qualified for that first Boston, I was training really intensely, a lot of speed work, a lot of track workouts, super, super fast and overtraining. And I did, I fractured my pelvic bone, uh, shortly after that marathon. So, um, I did. That sounds awful. <laughs> it, it, it was pretty awful, Patrick, I will tell you, but that's kind of what led into the next phase in, in getting to that Ironman because I was absolutely determined um, to still go to Boston despite that injury. And so I was um, stuck and I say stuck because if you've ever been introduced to having to aqua jog, it's uh, quite terrible. Um, oh. But it's a great, you know, it's you're literally running in the water. So yeah. I, I haven't had that pleasure, but I've seen others do it. It doesn't look very fun. <laughs> it's not. It's not fun at all. Uh, and so just hours in the pool aqua jogging. And um, and then I got to go where I was doing physical therapy. They had the Alter G machine, the the way weightless treadmill. Okay. And so they had me in that and that alter G machine, you know, with just slowly adding pressure was how I trained for that first Boston marathon. Uh, so that was not the best training experience. And honestly, I should have probably taken a step to, you know, taken a step back at that time, but I didn't, I was pretty uh, stubborn and hard headed on that. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. that's yeah. The aqua jogging, that just sounds like the definition of running nowhere fast. <laughs> yes. And really I would just, yeah, you tether yourself to one end of the pool, the deep end, and you can just, you know, sit there and run in place for hours. Oh. Uh, but so, with that, that's how I kind of got hooked in, you know, to the, to the group in the neighborhood who swims, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, the swimming guys, as I call y'all, my swim group, uh, you're yes, part of that it's, now. It's, it's, yes. It's my text stream that sometimes just won't go off. It won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Random things. And, you know, we haven't all swam together in several months now and everybody's kind of gone off on their different, you know, seasons of life, but I still refer to y'all as my, my swim guys. Oh yeah. Uh, it's a good so. group. It's a great group. I know. I sure, sure do miss it. But great connections and, you know, friendships were built from that. It is. Well, so, so now I'm starting to understand this running background. And, you know, for our listeners who don't really understand Ironman, um, the, obviously the, the marathon is the end. And, and it's really the, what in my opinion is the most difficult part of an Ironman because it's at the end <laughs> and it's a full <laughs> marathon. So now I'm understanding where you're, I mean, you're good at all three disciplines, but the fact that you're such a strong marathon runner is really a, a plus, uh, it's a benefit. And, and that's now I understand, uh, how it all comes together. So now before we go to Ironman specifically, I'm very intrigued. Um, because I've been to Boston and I know how hilly it is and I know what a beautiful city it is. Um, but I can't imagine running a marathon through Boston. So just, can you tell, tell me a little bit about what that experience was like and, um, what the draw is to Boston and, you know, how hard is it? Is it, is it, you know, 26 miles there way harder than, you know, somewhere else like Houston or just, just kind of give me some perspective. Uh, definitely more challenging because of the hills that are there. Um, but it's just, I mean, it's the world class marathon. It's the, you know, it's kind of like the, the world championship of marathons. You know, you, everybody wants to Boston qualify. You have to have a qualifying time, um, to go to Boston. And, so, and it has to be with a full marathon. You can't have a half marathon time that qualifies you for Boston. Okay. Um, and it's just, the atmosphere, the city, they all just rally around and support the marathon. And so it's so amazing. The, you know, race week, marathon week in Boston is all about the race. You know, runners from all over the world are welcomed. The city mm -hmm. is just, you know, buzzing with all, you know, marathon and running related things and shops. And um, my experience was very positive. The, I mean, everything from the subway system to, you know, the race day itself, literally everybody was just excited and happy about the marathon. And so it really is more of a, 
an atmosphere and cultural thing that they have built in that city, that this is an amazing marathon to be at. Um, and the year I was there, so also kind of, I know you know this about me, but I really love the heat. I, I love, I love it. The hotter, the better. I love running when it's hot. I love, you know, cycling when it's hot. That's, that's my thing. When it gets cold outside, that's when I'm a baby and, you know, my training kind of goes south. Uh, <laughs> with, with Boston, well, you live in the right place for, for I, the heat. I absolutely do. So traveling north to any race is a challenge. Um, but, you know, Boston, it's it's hit or miss. Some years it's freezing. It's been raining. I know one year the freezing rain and sleet, you know, that just knocked a lot of people out of the race that year. Um, what, what month of the year is the race held? It's in April. Okay. So April, I think this year will be April 15th. So it's... Um, Oh, goodness, that second or third Monday in April every year. Yeah, it's and still just about winter. Most 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 parts of the country, that's spring. But in Boston, I've been there on business trips and, you know, thinking I was going to go run in a light wind jacket and froze in <laughs> April. <laughs> yes. It can be really cold. It can be cold. But the year I was that I, I ran, it was 2019, I believe is. Yeah, 2019, right before, you know, all of COVID happened. Um, but it, it was warm and beautiful. Oh. And so I was thrilled. I was like, all oh, right. There were, you know, the volunteers and people on, you know, just the, the crowd that was cheering. They were handing out the popsicles. It was so warm, cold wash rags and sponges. You know, they had the fire hydrants open spraying people. So I was living my best life because I was like, oh, this is warm. This is it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so fun. And you're so you're scheduled to be there in a few months. Yes. Right? Yeah. April, April 15th this year. I'm really excited. So it'll be round two and uh, hopefully, you know, just praying this training cycle strong and healthy. And so I can actually experience Boston um, as a healthy trained runner and not um, somebody who just kind of got through uh, to get there and make it happen. Oh, man. Well, that's awesome. And I, I will tell you, um, I hope that the weather's wonderful for you on that, on that trip. And I hope it's warm and balmy and beautiful, but the, as you know, I'm a very avid skier and, <laughs> and this, 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 the snow is down everywhere early in the season. It's, it's been a light winter. And that usually means that, that the March, February, March time frame is usually heavier. So if that trend continues, hopefully it'll get out of there before April oh, <laughs> in that Northeast yeah. section. <laughs> we'll watch it. I'm going to watch closely now that I know you're going to be there. Yes. Yeah. I'll have to stay on top of that. And, you know, just kind of maybe that will be a new challenge if it is super cold to, to have to run in that weather. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. So so a little I mean, this is we're going to get to some gear talk here a little bit, but I do have a question. So um, when you're running a marathon versus Ironman, do you just use the same running shoes or do you? use a different shoe for the marathon and an Ironman as opposed to your regular marathons. I personally run in the same shoe. Um, that, that same shoe now has changed, you know, over the course of the years, I've like different shoes as I've gone along, but no, recently I just, the same, I mean, you know, it'd be a new pair of the same shoe, but I'll wear the same shoe in a regular marathon that I wear, um, during the iron, the Ironman marathon. Okay. What, what is your shoe of choice? All right. Well, right now I know cause I've gone all over the place and I usually have several different brands. Uh, but right now the Saucony endorphin speed shoe is my favorite. Uh, okay. and that's for the long runs, you know, that's kind of, like I said, I have different shoes, but that's my long run shoe. And I think I have like four pairs of that particular shoe right now. So I rotate them um, on my long runs. And what is it you like about that shoe? I personally like the cushion. I like the way it fits on my foot. Um, it just, it's light to me. I feel like it's a light shoe. I have, I have tried as hard as I can over the last several years to make Nike shoes fit my foot. And, you know, a lot of my runner friends, they, they wear the Nikes, the different kinds, the new ones, the, you know, ones that'll help you be faster and all the things, but a Nike shoe just doesn't fit my foot. 
so I can't, I can't do Nike at all. Um, but yeah, the Saucony seems to work for me and I have found the one I love. And so, you know, you don't, don't change what's not broken. So I just keep doing that. Uh, okay. I also though, for speed days, cause that's, you know, a little different when I'm doing speed workouts. Um, I have the, the Brooks Hyperion tempo shoe. Yeah. And I okay. love that. And in the past too, there have been many different Brooks shoes that I'll that I've worn on my long runs as well. Uh, just kind of sometimes when a shoe you know that you love, they update. You know they'll have like oh, okay the the endorphin speed twos, the endorphin speed you know threes and fours and so on. Yeah. Um, the Brooks that, Ghosts fourteen. <laughs> yes, exactly. But when yeah. they. And, but every iteration of the shoe changes the shoe a little bit. And then sometimes that slight change, whether it be, you know, something around the heel or the way that, mm -hmm. you know, the shoe laces up or fits, like sometimes it's not the same as the previous iteration of that shoe. And so, and so that's why I change it, I guess, or it has changed over the past, you know, when I have to jump to a new shoe and it's always very disappointing. I hate trying to find a new good running shoe. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I'm sensitive when I choose shoes as I've gotten older is the amount of drop. And, and I actually prefer seven to 10 millimeters of drop because it, it puts less pressure on my uh, Achilles and, and the bursa sac that's in my heel. Um, I'm not a very flexible person. So the more drop, the better for me. Do you, do you think about drop when you're looking at your shoes or is that something you don't have to worry about? So I, I did, cause there was a season when I couldn't find the right shoe, you know? And so I did, I went, you know, deep down into the research, you know, hole when you can kind of keep going down that rabbit hole. And I did, I was all about the drop and I was determined that I needed this amount of drop. And, and that's important too, when you're changing shoes, cause you don't want to drastically change that drop. If you do switch to a new shoe, uh, cause that could alter you know, just, yeah, how your muscles are stretching and, and how you're running. So I did go down that rabbit hole, but honestly, I, you know, stopped paying attention to that. It was like, no, it was more about when I put that shoe on, how does it feel? And, um, you know, go on a little practice run. How does that shoe feel? So I just kind of go by feel more than the actual, okay, what is this drop? Cause I did try to do that and, mm -hmm. and it didn't always work out. Okay. Good to know. See, this is why you are an expert guest. This yeah. is great. <laughs> These are great insights. And some of our listeners are going to be like, what? What's drop? Drop, by the way, is the 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 heel relative to the toe in the shoe. And so a 10 millimeter drop is that the heel is 10 millimeters higher than the toe. Um, and it takes some pressure off. Um, there are zero drop shoes, which are effectively the same as being barefoot, um, where it's very flat. Um, and so anyway, so there can be a lot. A lot goes into shoe design. Not all shoes are created equal. But Absolutely. great, great perspective, Meredith. That's awesome. That's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, on that note, you said expert in this and I don't, I personally don't think so, but I feel like every person is different. And so even you can go this route, you know, like we're talking about shoes right now, but when we're talking about, you know, nutrition or what works for you and how you should be you know, doing this or that. Every person is different. So I don't feel like there's one single or, you know, like, okay, here's the criteria and here is the equation for what you need to be looking for or doing. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of what I found works for me is just that trial and error. You know, you have to, you just have to go for it. And, and sometimes not always like, yes, you need to look at those numbers and the metrics and that, you know, equation type, you know, everything that'll help it fit together. But sometimes you just have to go by what feels right or what you know is right for your body or for yourself. Does that make yeah. sense? So it's a lot oh. of personal, um, you know, things too. And I think that kind of leads me to the comment that that's, that also helps it be more enjoyable sometimes because, you know, for me, I'm not an elite athlete. And so as you know, hindsight, like that would have been a great, amazing path to go on in life. That would be so much fun, I would think. But, um, you know, we have to love what we do. And if you're so stuck to a system or a rule or looking for like that, a certain drop in a shoe or this or that, like it can kind of take all the fun out of it, you know, and, and what you're just here to do to enjoy life and as a, a pastime. No, you're, you're a hundred percent right. 
And, you know, what I like to say in, in regards to this, you know, endurance sport training, there are, there really aren't any wrong answers. It's determining what the right answer is for you as an individual. Absolutely. And you said it right on the mark. And, and then I've got to disagree with you a little bit because okay. you said you're, you know, you're, you're not an elite athlete. Well, I would say you're not a professional triathlete, but you are definitely an elite athlete. And what I mean by that is, and here's the definition, Meredith, you qualified for and participated in the Ironman World Championships in 2023. You were one of 2,041 competitors in that event in the world. That's okay. what I definitely would define as elite. So oh, yeah. <laughs> you're qualified. Thank you. I'll take it. I like it. <laughs> yes, you are qualified. So let's let's spin back to uh, Iron Man now. And how many? Basically, when was your first Iron Man, and how many Iron Man events, including half and full, have you have you competed in? <laughs> okay, that's where. Yes, um, knowing what you just said, and then what I'm about to say is going to be kind of funny. Um, I. Uh, have only competed in four full Ironman competitions, um, including Kona. That was number four. Um, and I have never participated in a half Ironman competition by myself. I have done a half Ironman as a relay where I was just the runner, but I've never competed in a, in a half by myself. So, so that's very <laughs> interesting because what I consider to be most normal um, Ironman triathletes <laughs> dip their toe in a half first. <laughs> yeah, I just all in. You know what? I'm gonna jump. Yeah, feet first, all the way in. And it's historically, I kind of do that. I remember a few years ago, some of my running friends called and they were like, "Hey, we're all gonna go do, um, you know, rim to rim to rim, uh, Grand Canyon." And so yeah, I'm like, "Great, never heard of it. Sign me up. How do I sign up? Where do I register?" Um, and that was, you know, my first. Comment. They kind of know I'll just jump feet first all in before I know all the details or, um, you know, have experienced anything like it. So kind of same thing with Iron Man. I, you know, volunteered for several years um, in the woodlands at Iron Man, Texas. And oh, my goodness, just the energy and the excitement of volunteering and having, you know, watching all the athletes uh, perform and just pour their heart out on the course is just it was so inspiring and amazing. And then uh, one year I volunteered I watched a couple of my my running friends who, you know, had just jumped in and decided to train and, and do an Ironman. And after seeing them finish, I was like, I can absolutely do this. This this is it all of a sudden was just something I wanted to try and go for. Uh, so my first um, Ironman was Ironman Texas, and that was in 2022. I had to remember correctly. Yeah, 22. And that then my second one was that next November 2022. And that was Ironman Arizona. And you were there for that one. <laughs> I was. I was. That's a story in itself. <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a whole nother podcast episode if we want to go there. But that <laughs> for oh. me was not a, a preferred race or a great day uh, at all for me. So <laughs> it was a challenging environment. Uh, for sure. in that day, um, extremely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so. so just to, just to get, well, that will divert just a little bit, but just so the listeners know in 22 in Arizona, it's a really fast course and it's a awesome environment. It's held in Tempe. You swim in Tempe town Lake. It's very festive. A lot of people, I mean, it's just a great environment and, and it was really fun to be part of the race. Uh, but the, but the race course is, uh, it's just an interesting thing because you, you swim in, in Tempe town Lake and it happened to be that year, the water temperature on my Garmin watch was 55 degrees. Yes. Uh, it, which was extremely cold. It is Meredith mentioned and she doesn't like cold um, and it was brutally cold and then on top of that I've heard there were I, I don't know close to 40 or 50 people that were pulled out of the water uh, by boats and by 
um, jet skis and I couldn't figure it out. I'm not a fast swimmer, but I kept getting hit by waves <laughs> while I was yes. out there. And it was the waves being caused by the jet skis and the boats pulling people out of water. And so it was just a, it was kind of a miserable swim, honestly. And, um, but it was a super fun event and it was, then there was a bunch of wind, uh, on the bike, which the bike is, um, up about a 6% grade, but you get to come down that same 6% grade, but the up was pretty brutal. There was a 15 to 20 mile an hour wind, um, that sometimes it's a crosswind, but this time it was coming straight in your face as you're going up. And, uh, so it made the bike interesting. And then the marathon itself was pretty awesome. If you survived the swim in the bike. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. That about sums it up. It was, <laughs> it was pretty rough. Oh, oh my goodness. So, uh, Oh, that is that's so funny. Yeah, it was it was my first full Iron Man, and it might have been my last, but it was <laughs> but it was definitely fun. So <laughs> I've got to ask you. So you've done these four events. You did two Texas, Arizona, and then the World Championships. I'm going to guess that your favorite was the World Championships, but um, I'll let you answer the question. I'm, that's my assumption. Okay, and and actually, no, uh, I am I, wrong. Okay, I, I said. <laughs> Hands down, Texas is my favorite Ironman. And now I've only done them in three different locations. But for me, Ironman Texas, since it's, you know, right there in the heart of the Woodlands, Texas, that's where I run and train. Um, I love it because compared to Arizona and even the World Championship course in Kona, the crowd support and the volunteers are hands down the best around in the Woodlands, Texas. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it's like the, especially the run, but even when you're racing Texas and you're out there on the Hardy, on the Hardy toll road, there are people out there cheering and, you know, all along the way, it's super exciting, but the run course is for me, constant, just, you know, pushing you forward because of all the people cheering and at, all along the course. I absolutely loved it. Um, Kona was amazing. Don't get me wrong. That was absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. The way that the bike courses, then of course the run, there's limited opportunity for people to be along those courses to cheer you on. So it's a lot of uh, solo time, which is also fine because I, you know, like that too, just to get in my own head and focus and go. Uh, but it did definitely make it hard knowing, okay, there's nobody out here. Like I'm not going to see anybody for miles upon miles. Yeah, that is interesting. So, yeah, okay. I know that was, I shocked you there. That was, you did, <laughs> you did. Cause I mean, the allure of Kona and I've, I've, I've never been to the, the big Island, but I've, I've been to Kauai and the, the, just, you know, the, the islands are a special, special place. Um, and you know, living in Houston, I'm very familiar with the area and it's, you know, it's nice. I mean, obviously the people are fantastic here. And that's really what I heard from you is that you love the people that are supporting the race and, and, uh, Houstonians are great. So, um, I've never, I've never done Texas, but, um, and the main reason is cause it's in the spring and that's with my boys being so active in, in baseball over the last several years and continue, one of them's continuing to do so it kind of limits my ability to put the volume of training in, in that time frame. but maybe, maybe Texas based on your, your like, maybe, maybe one day I'll do Texas. So you have we'll to see. do it. I highly recommend it. Yes. Yeah. So when your boys are done with baseball, then that's, that's your focus. <laughs> yeah, it could, could be, it's uh, it, that'd be close to home and it'd be easy. That's for sure. Compared to, you know, flying your bike and, you know, doing everything that's involved and you do it on a, out of state had a state trip. So we'll talk more about that. Yeah. So, so, okay, let's zero in. So how did you qualify for the world championships? I, so, and, and that is uh, maybe a touchy subject in the, you know, Ironman world. I do know that. Uh, so those of you that don't know Ironman, typically or historically, uh, the world championship is hosted in Kona, Hawaii, and it's men and women together. If you've qualified, you're the best of the best, you know, you go to the world championship. So this last year was the first year that uh, Ironman split the men and the women. Um, so the world championship for the women was in Kona and the men were in Nice, France. And 
now moving forward, they'll switch. So this year in 2024, coming up, the women will be in Nice, France, and then the men will be in Kona, Hawaii. And so they'll just kind of flip flop it every year. And because of that, they opened up for the women, at least, I know there were extra allocations and spots uh, for the world championship leading up to that. And kind of jumping back and then tying it in, the reason that one of the reasons I raced Arizona that year was because Arizona was a race that had extra allocations for women to qualify for Kona. Um, So, you know, I was after that. I was like, oh, okay, this is, like you said, it's supposed to be a fast course. This is what I'm going for, you know, kind of like all in, you know, like I said, jump Mm -hmm. two feet in, all in, let's do it. Uh, And then that was, of course, not the race. And that was not a good race day for me at all. Um, So coming back to the spring, focusing on Texas, uh, 2023, that was my goal was, you know, to get one of those extra allocations and to qualify for Kona. Um, And I say that's kind of controversial because I know some people are not happy that, you know, Kona or sorry, the Ironman opened up extra allocations for, for men and women to qualify for that. Um, for that race. Uh, like you said, though, it still limits the amount of people who are, who are in that race. There were 2,041 women in Kona last year. Uh, so I finished Texas in 2023, 17th in my age group. And, um, you know, that's pretty far down there. 17th is not even in the top 10 there. So usually I believe it's the, you know, top five top three to five women usually get a spot, you know, they're, they're given that spot and they had extra spots. Um, so I secured my Kona uh, world championship spot with one of those extra allocations that were in my age group. Hey, that's, that is awesome. And, and it doesn't take away and it should not take away from you competing there. And, you met the criteria you qualified. So I think it's awesome. And yeah. what an amazing accomplishment. I can't even, um, you know, for, I mean, I don't think I'm physically capable <laughs> of doing the times you did, uh, to get there. So, uh, it's pretty awesome. Now I, I, I do, uh, you know, I've got a good friend. Um, I don't think you know him, but his name is Rick Thibodeau. And he actually has qualified uh, for the Ironman World Championships. Um, and he's done it through the Ironman Legacy Program. Okay, yes. Right, which means he's done, uh, I think the number is either, it's either 12 or 15 Ironman. I did an episode with him and we talk about it there. But it's a it's a huge number, right? It's been something he's pursued for a long, long time. And um, he actually, uh, because of that change you outlined so, so articulately, um, he... Uh, if you will, delayed, um, he was supposed to compete or he could have competed in Nice last year, but he delayed because his dream is to do Kona. So he'll be in Kona this year in the men's world championships. Oh, right. and, um, that's awesome. Like, it's just incredible. It's awesome. And, and just to know what's involved. Now I do want to ask you this because you've raced in, you know, all the Ironman races that you've done, uh, or under the normal format where it's men and women combined and, you know, I, I experienced that in, in the uh, Tempe, Arizona Ironman, and I and I really liked having both genders there. It was just a cool environment. I wanted to ask you at the World Championships, with it only being women, was it significantly different to you? Was it just a, a race? Did you notice anything different in the in the vibe, or was it no big deal? Yeah, I will say, I I hadn't thought twice about that until. I was in Hawaii and then it kind of hit me, you know, as we're, you know, going through race week, I was like, oh, this is going to be very different, like you said, because there will only be women in this race. And I'm used to, you know, when you start a race, I'm, I'm swimming beside, you know, men and women, you know, Mm -hmm. of all ages, all shapes and sizes, like, here we go. We're all together. Um, and I was like, oh, this is only going to be women. We'll see how this goes. Uh, I will tell you the, I feel, felt like the vibe, uh, was very different because maybe because we're all women, I don't know, but it was, it was pretty vicious and it was, pretty, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, it's like, especially at that caliber. And if you qualify for Kona and you're there, you know, like you've mentioned, you're kind of at this, you know, top level, 
Um, and so very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, of these women are not very friendly or nice. And and especially in the swim, I noticed a lot. Um, you know, you kind of had to fight for your spot in the water sometimes. Um, and there was there was maybe a lot more of that happening than I've felt in previous co-ed races. So okay. just kind of wanted to be that that dominant swimmer or that dominant racer and um, be in that better position. So, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. No, that's interesting. And thank you for your honesty and sharing that, because it's it's something I've been trying to figure out is what that would be like, uh, because, you know, like I said, I was only heavily involved in the Ironman stuff for a couple of years. But the sense of community was amazing. And, you know, when most people were racing the marathon. I was making friends <laughs> and I was talking to men, talking to women and just having a blast. And, and, uh, it was, I don't know, to me, having both genders involved in the race is kind of a, a really cool thing and part of the community. So, um, it, you know, it sounds like it, it's just, it's different experience, it's not a bad, not a bad thing, but just yeah. different. So. Yeah, absolutely. Just different. And I was so blessed because there was a huge group um, of women that were at Kona with me from the Woodlands. So okay. women that I trained with on a regular basis, great friends of mine. So I think that was also really cool because, you know, that we had that core group of people that we know I wasn't there just on my own, not knowing anybody. So, you know, out there on the marathon course, we were able to, you know, holler at each other and tell each other great job and encourage each other along. Um, and as well as the race week, you know, leading up to that, it was so much fun to do the pra practice swims and, you know, go do the practice rides with them and, and have that group of people. And then in addition to that, um, I am, I am part of team Zoot and that, I absolutely love Zoot. I mean, I love their products. I love their clothing, but, um, team Zoot had a huge meetup. And so, you know, very supportive group of people there. So there was still, of course, that, you know, camaraderie and team, you know, connectedness that, that was there. It wasn't all vicious. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, that's good. It's Ironman is a very special community, but, but I can also understand. I mean, that's a, at the world championships, you've made unbelievable sacrifices as a competitor to get there, right. As everyone has and they want to do well. And so, you know, they're to race, right. They're to compete. And, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so that edge, that edge at that level, I'm sure it plays, plays a big role. And by the way, team Zoot. So I was on the, uh, and actually still am part of the Kwame racing team and uh, love their gear. But, but I will admit that there's some Zoot equipment that I've purchased during my years that I enjoy, you know, riding and running in as well. They're really good stuff. In fact, when I was in Arizona, there was a great team Zoot um, puffy jacket. Uh, you've probably seen him, a black and gray puffy oh, yes. jacket yep. with a hood, right? I wear that all the time. I was wearing it the other day. I mean, I love it. So Zoot makes some really good stuff for sure. They absolutely do. Yeah, they have. And they have, you know, swim, bike and run gear. So it's so funny because every year at Christmas, uh, that's what a lot of my family members receive. They receive uh, Zoot. Zoot gear. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're good. And I, I will have to, you know, Kawami is really good stuff as well. They make great uh, racing kits. Um, so I like them both. Zoot and Kawami are both really, really high end. And if you are thinking about doing any kind of uh, Ironman events for a, especially long course, uh, make sure you get a really good kit. And, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your bicycling bibs will not translate. You need, you need a proper Iron Man long course type bib, either from a Zoot or a Kwame, a reputable manufacturer. It'll make a difference. It'll make your life much, much better. I promise. It will. Yes, it will. <laughs> I promise. All right. So Meredith, so um, specifically when you're talking about the world championships, I'm really interested in how you trained for it and, you know, things like when did you start any challenges? Did you have any injuries or illnesses, any memorable training days kind of take us into what it took to get you ready for, you know, once you knew you qualified to actually prepare and get ready for the world championships. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so 
my training cycle, it was a 15 week training cycle. And so since Kona was in October, my training cycle started on July 1st. And um, I'm going to kind of step out of this really quick. I um, once I'm committed to something, I am all in. So I I can be very um dedicated to whatever, you know, training cycle or program is happening in my life. And I say that because, you know, training started July 1st and it was a very intense training cycle, you know, for 15 weeks. And so if there was a swim or a run or a bike on the schedule, um, I, I make sure to get it done. So with that, uh, you know, in my line of work, I only have two weeks off in the summer. So there were two weeks of this training cycle that, you know, I had off. I wasn't having to come to work. But the, the remainder of this training cycle, all of my sessions had to occur um, before and after school and, you know, work hours. So I was up super early every single day, you know, between 4.20 and 4.30, ready to go. <laughs> and then I know. And then some days, honestly, especially when the school year gets started, that's a crazy time of year. And, you know, in my position, there's, it's there's always busy and something always happens at the end of the day. <laughs> and so, you know, the days that I was getting home at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, I did not want to get on the bike or go on a run or whatever that workout needed to do. But I was committed to it. Um, and so I'd make myself go. Um, so I know not everybody is like that. So I feel like I almost kind of become this very rigid. Um, I, I am flexible of course, but I've got this, this rigid, I guess, daily schedule. And, you know, like we've already talked about with the busyness, I've got, you know, a husband and four children who also, you know, need my time and attention that, um, I have to really stick to my schedule and my plan. And I can't deviate from that very much as far as like extra things. If, you know, my friends are getting together for dinner or going to go do something fun, it's, I really have to consider that. Like, am I going to, going to be able to wake up the next morning and do my workout or, yeah. you know, can I go just visit them for like 30 minutes and, and be social and see all my friends or do this extra thing and then have to go home and, and get in bed in order to be up super early the next day. Mm. Well, how, um, so how many hours a day and in, in week was your training plan? Um, I, oh, I wish I had my, I have a training journal that I complete and I filled out literally how many actual days I trained in that, se in that session. Uh, cause the hours that add added up, I think it was like seven to nine full days of training, but it was, I was working out, um, between 17 and 20 hours a week. Wow. Uh, so it was, you know, a part-time job on the, on top of my full-time job and my, yeah. family. uh, but again, just dedicated to getting that in. And, uh, I have an amazing coach, uh, coach Kate Looney, uh, with Mach five racing. She, uh, has been my coach, uh, for the last a little over a year and she's amazing. What I love is she kind of came from that runner back running background as well. And she is an amazing triathlete. I mean, her, if I could cycle like her, that would be amazing. But she's been to Kona. She's, you know, gone through all those things. So I really feel like she gets me and my specific training needs. Um, but yeah, we, we trained all through the summer, uh, starting July 1st. And so again, like I've mentioned, I love the heat. So I was all for it. This is great. But I was <laughs> I will tell you when you have a, you know, six to seven hour bike ride out in Belleville on the hills oh, and it's yep. 110 degrees outside, um, it, it got a little rough. <laughs> I can, yes, I, I know those days and, uh, God bless you for, <laughs> for doing it. It's um, hard. Well, and I learned and she told me, I mean, she, you know, early on, she was like, uh, the hills and the heat learned to love them. And, so that was kind of like a mantra that I kept, you know, uh, hills and heat, learn to love them. Well, and, and Meredith, you know, I follow you on, on Strava, right? We're friends and I can see your workouts posted. And I remember, I remember um, watching your 100 mile rides post, 115 mile rides posted. And I remember seeing 18 and a half, 19 and a half miles per hour averages for those rides. I mean, you were 
you were really strong prior to Kona. Oh, thank you. I and I really, um, you know, think that is because you know, just the intense schedule that I had, but also my coach said, you have to get out to the Hills, you know, get out to Belleville. You've got to make this happen. Uh, and so just practicing on the, on the Hills and getting that in was very important. And I learned to love it. I, I miss Belleville now going out there. I'm like, I need to get out there on a weekend when it's nice again. (laughs) Yes. Yes, for sure. Sure. Um, so did, did you, uh, during this training period, it was 15 weeks. Did you, you know, in, encounter any injuries or illnesses or was everything just good? Uh, there were a couple of times there was, uh, one week I was ill and I was, um, I can't remember what I had, maybe just a bad cold or something. Um, but I literally just didn't have energy and I was out and I was so frustrated and it was kind of early on. It might've been you know, August and, um, and I, but I was like, I can't miss a week. I can't miss a workout. So, uh, that was frustrating, but you know, regardless of having to step back that week and, and recover, everything was fine. Uh, you know, jumped right back in no problem. But as far as, um, injuries, there were multiple times that I kind of have, um, I have an ongoing knee, um, I guess something with my knee and it's something with the cartilage in my knee. I was told, uh, I guess a couple of years ago, you know, I have several scans and, you know, went to an orthopedic surgeon and all this about my knee because it would hurt so bad when I would try mm. to run. And uh, so I have like a cartilage flapping. I can't remember what the, you know, technical term is for that, but there is something on my knee that continues to happen. And, um, I, I do know that this one specific surgeon had told me, he was like, well, you know, you, you have to have surgery and, um, you know, you'll never run a marathon again. (laughs) And I, I do have to say that was a little bit of fuel for my fire. Um, because when people, if anybody tells me I can't do something, my immediate response is, okay, watch me show you, I will do this. Um, and so I kind of have this, this, again, you know, just kind of crazy mindset and, you know, extreme, maybe extreme thinking. I don't know. Uh, but (laughs) so I kind of, I've learned to really know my body. And when I feel that starting to happen or something starting to hurt, um, I don't have a problem pulling back or switching gears. Like there, there were a few days and several times it was like, Oh, I knew I shouldn't go on a run. So I would jump on the elliptical machine or I would do an extra bike ride instead of that run because I knew that run would maybe just push me just a little too far. And I didn't, it was safer to, you know, switch gears than to push forward and know I'd get injured. Okay. Smart. That's a smart so, approach. Yeah. That's a smart approach. Okay, good. So, so generally speaking, right. You, this training segment was 15 weeks and you stuck to the plan that your coach built for you. And when you came out of this, you felt really well prepared for Kona. I did. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, that's a great spot. Now, the other side of this is you've done all this training and preparation, your body and your mind is physically ready to go. But uh, a big part of Ironman is the equipment that you choose to use, right? Everything from running shoes to your run nutrition, to your bike, to your cycling shoes, to your kit, to, you know, swimming, your goggles, um, you know, the environment you're training and all that kind of stuff. So I'd like to kind of talk about that piece of it, right? which is, you know, 50% of the Ironman experience. Um, take us kind of through, we talked about the running shoes a little bit, um, but I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in cycling, kind of, you know, what your, what your gear is there, what you use to get you through this training, um, what your cycling training environment was like, and then moving into the swim, you know, do you have a favorite pair of goggles? What's, uh, what, you know, what's, how do you approach that? And then nutrition, what, what do you do um, here? biking a hundred miles, you know, what's your go-to there. Um, so kind of just take us through that, that side of it, the equipment, the nutrition side of it and, and preparation for, for Kona. All right. And that's, uh, we're definitely getting into a, a place that, um, I'm not an expert. I do feel like in, in between all three disciplines, cycling is, uh, 
my weakest area. And, you know, I'm still learning about all of these things, but I do have, uh, I ride an Argon 18. That's my bike. Uh, I absolutely love the Argon bike. My husband is trying to get me to look at Trek or something else. And I'm like, no, I love my Argon. Like <laughs> if hey, anything- Argon, Argons are awesome, but I, and, I, and I've been riding a Cervelo, which I love, but man, those Canyon speeds look so good. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. There are some nice looking bikes and I, I would love to have a brand new bike. Uh, you know, just They're uh, so expensive affordability right now I got to stick with with my bike <laughs> which well, I love my I've, bike though I've ridden with you a few times and your argon's plenty fast <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank Yeah, I, I like it. It's a it's a, been a great bike. Um, I was able to, oh, be, I guess right before I started training for Kona, um, I was able to to update some things on my bike. So that was really nice. Um, and and what, what type of things are that like bars and, and clips or what what were, what were we talking about? So, well, I got some new wheels and okay. I had had some on my Argon I had had some really deep um, wheels. And so I went with, uh, I guess, I don't know the technical terms on all this, Patrick, but uh, just not as a uh, little less, uh, not as deep. So for me, so especially, lighter. yes, a little bit lighter. Cause I, I also, um, you know, I don't, I don't weigh a whole lot. And so this, when I'm on my bike and especially in windy conditions with those deep dish wheels that I had, I mean, any little bit of wind comes. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I really have to hold on, you know, or lean into it. And I knew, um, from, you know, just what I'd been told and what my coach had told me, you know, Kona's wind is no joke. And it comes from, all different directions. It's not like you just have a headwind or a wind from one direction. It might be one direction um, in this second, but in the very next second, it's coming from another direction. So um, we did, you know, fix my wheels a little bit. I went with some new head wheels um, and I absolutely love them. Um, they make a made a world of difference as far as like being able to ride in the wind yeah. and and not feel that ooh here I go I'm I'm you know falling yeah, that, or sailing away yeah. okay that, that <laughs> makes makes a ton of sense yeah so and then just I um, got a new power meter uh, maybe some other little technical things but just you know some some equipment like that that was really helpful okay very good now now I did obviously uh, there was a, a when I was training, um, obviously I did a lot of training on the roads and the weekends, but I, I spent a lot of time on my trainer in indoors. Um, and I believe you used an indoor trainer as well. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of your setup, what you where, just kind of what, what that was like? Yeah, I, um, I love my trainer. Yes, I use the trainer. And it, that also goes to me being a big baby because I am a fair weather person. And so if it's too cold outside or especially if it's raining, I do not want to take my bike outside. Uh, so my trainer, I have the kicker core mm-hmm. yep. and I absolutely love that trainer. I, I know, you know, Kicker makes a great product, but I really like the Kicker Core. And, you know, it's got all the Bluetooth capabilities. And, you know, I just take off my back wheel and pop my bike on that trainer. And uh, I have a great setup in my garage. I will say uh, my husband, you know, have, we have a TV on a little stand so I can, you know, plug that in and, and watch TV. I really, I don't do that a whole lot, though. That's on a rare occasion. I yeah, but That's good. You know, also, I mean, in Houston... As you were training through the summer, um, you were training for the Kona heat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Had to be. Oh, my gosh. Well, and on that note, my my trainer is set up in my garage. Um, and and so it does get quite warm out there in the summer. But yeah. I refuse to bring it inside. And I, I just don't know why. But mentally, I'm like, no, no, the bike belongs outside. So it has to stay in the garage. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I have my fan set up and, you know, I listen to podcasts and audio books and music and, you know, just kind of have a, my whole little setup there. Which writing software do you, do you choose to use? Okay. So that's also, um, I, I have never, I'm just now playing with Zwift. Um, really? So I'm going to be really honest. I, with all my training cycles so far, I have not used any of those. I, 
I would, I'm trying to get on the Zwift board, but I just kind of, I just go, I have, you know, the Wahoo app. And so the kicker app um, that I use, and then I have my bike computer that's connected to my trainer and, you know, my workout will be on my bike computer. So I know, you know, what my next step is or what I need to do, but I've never done the, the Zwift or Ruby or any of those other. Man, I've used them all. I can have trainer road, Ruby, Zwift, uh, Wahoo <laughs> X. I've got done them all. I tell you what, if you're, if you, it sounds like you've got Zwift set up. So when you're ready for a little fun, um, do the Alp to Zwift. <laughs> it's, okay. it's 90 minutes to two hours of pure torture. It's really fun. All right. I've, done it, I've done it a couple of times. It's a, uh, it's a famous. So in the tour de France, there's one of the famous climbs, the Alpe de Huez, uh, which is in the front. I believe it's in the French Alps. And it's uh, one of those famous uh, climbs where you're just there. The cyclists just go up, 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 hairpin turns. <laughs> and Al- Alp de Zwift is an actual exact replica of that. And, um, so you're basically climbing up forever and, uh, it, I don't even think I could do it right now okay, <laughs> with my fitness know, level. I like a good challenge. So I'm, I made note of that just now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. It's good. Okay. So that's, that's cool. Um, let's, I guess pedals, uh, what's your, what's your choice for pedals? What do you use? I'm a big look guy. I like, I like the look carbon, um, I've always used look. And I think it's because of my skiing background They I use look bindings, to my skis, and I just like the, the secure, the secure fit. Um, what, what's been your choice for pedals? Yeah. Yep. That's it. I have the look pedals as well. So there yeah. we go. Um, I do. And I, um, I absolutely, um, my friend, uh, Philip Shama, Shama cycles. I don't know where, you know, you did all your work, but he's helped me with all of that. Like he helped okay. me update all those. Is your power, me- is your power meter in the look pedals? Is not. No, it's separate. Okay. Uh, so, and I honestly can't remember what brand that one is to be honest with you again, see the bike stuff. It's all, I'm still working on all that. All I'm, a, the, I'm a geek. I love the man, technology. I know I geek. try to be, it's kind of, and you know, I know a lot of, a lot of women who are, but it's one of those things. Like if I have all these guys who can just help me out or just tell me what to do with it, then that's all like they, they, you guys can know the details. I'll just take what you tell me. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, so two other pieces of race gear we need, need to understand. So let's talk, uh, swim, swim goggles preference. Do you have a favorite? What's, what's your deal? I do. I I'm hooked on the snake and pig goggles. Okay. Uh, Tell us about snake and pig. (laughs) So the snake and pig goggles, um, I feel they, they have different, you know, you can do the, the dark lens or the clear lens, you know, so depending on if you're doing open water swimming or pool swimming, you know, they have a goggle for you, but also I, I, again, I work out before school and after school. So the mornings that I have to swim before school, I really don't like to show up to work with goggle eyes. And so, you know, the big old ring stuck around my eyes. And then I feel like with the snake and pig goggles, I don't have that as bad. You know, it's, it limits that the goggle eye, I guess. Okay. And, and okay. it's comfortably for me, you know, on my face. So, and I have a lot of friends who train with that, those as well, the snake and pig, um, really great goggles. Okay. Okay, cool. Good to know. All right. And now the last bit of kit that I'm interested in is um, watch. Are you a, a you know a Garmin person or Apple Watch person? What 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 do you use? Yeah, Garmin all the way. So the way. yeah, I Only have looks- a Garmin bike computer, and then I have Garmin uh, watches that I wear. And my watch is the the seven forty five. Uh, might be the XT, but I know it's Garmin 745. And again, for me, I liked the features on some of the other Garmin's, but I, um, you know, have a very small wrist. And so I feel like for me, some of those Garmin watches will get on my arm and they just look massive and take up. (laughs) I know. I love it. I, 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 uh, I, I, I like Garmin as well. Um, I have an Apple Watch Ultegra that I do some things in, but all my Iron Man stuff was with a Garmin Phoenix 7X Solar. And uh, I always laugh because it looks like a coaster that you could just put a beer on. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. Yeah, uh, but, I, but I need to put a beer on that at some that, point at Iron Man. Yeah, ready well, for that. Truthful, <laughs> truthfully, why I why it worked well for me is I'm at that age now, right? I'm over fifty and um, started using reading glasses at you know forty five, but but with that large display, I was able to see it and read it without glasses. So for me, the seven X, that big, that big interface, um, was just made it possible so that I could read it. Yes. And when I was, um, before I got the seven forty five, I think I had the seven thirty five, but it wouldn't last, uh, the full, you know, 11 hours that I need for a full Ironman. So I was like, okay, I have to find a watch that is going to last you know, through yeah. the well, so, <laughs> well, Meredith, so to that point, that's where my 7X solar was outstanding because I need 15 hours for the full. <laughs> and it, it had plenty of juice. I don't think I charged it after the race. I think it was good the next day, too. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, they're like, just keep going. Yeah, so that's, that's that it. is a very important factor. Absolutely. You need to make sure you have the right gear, the right watch, especially that's going to be able to get you through the swims, the bikes, and the runs. Oh, so good. All right. So let's get to now you're traveling to the race. You've got all your gear set. You've been training for 15 weeks. You're good to go. Um, you know, Kona's not like it's around the corner. <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a lot. I'm assuming you flew there, right? You didn't take a boat. Oh yeah. <laughs> you flew, <Nope>. right? <laughs> we flew the whole family. We all, yeah, so- well, we almost all went. My, uh, one of my daughters is in the band, uh, at one of the high schools and she is super committed. And so she uh, decided that she needed to stay here to fulfill her band commitments over going to Hawaii. Uh, So I was again, pretty impressed with her, her commitment there, but yeah, we flew and I, you know, I've just heard some not great things about um, sending your bike. Uh, And so I took my bike in a bike box with me because I wanted to see it as you know, as much as I could throughout that whole process. <laughs> and no, no issues work fine, right? Oh, it did. It worked fine. We, you know, checked it on as a checked bag or, you know, checked bike box, but, um, yeah, it made it there. No, no problem. And honestly, you know, I was like, if it's, if it's lost coming home, that's fine. We'll figure it out. I just needed it to get there and to get there safely in one piece. And it did, it arrived with us right on time. And, uh, you know, my husband of course is a Amazing, And so he, cause I do have a bike box where you have to take off the handles and the seat post. Yeah. I know there's different boxes and different bike bags, uh, but he, you know, had all the measurements marked. And so when we got there, you know, he put everything back into you know, the handlebars and the seat back where it needed to be. Uh, so that was, and then of course I just ran it, you know, to a little, uh, you know, tent that was set up at Kona for them to run, you know, run through the gears and make sure that everything was good. Yeah, that's awesome. That is yeah. really good. That's, you know, so I'm, I, when I went to Arizona, I used a Scion um, soft bag that has hard elements in it. And um, you just take the wheels off and that worked really, really well. I'm a big fan of that. I've, I've flown for years with skis and the whole bit. So airlines generally speak pretty good. Um, yeah, pretty good. I just, you know, you hear those horror stories and it's like, oh no, the bike didn't arrive or the, like that, if whatever yep. gear you have. And I'm like, so I did, I checked all my kit and everything else that I had to have for race day. I put in my carry on bag. Okay. Uh, so it smart. was with me. That's uh-huh. smart. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, so how many days before the race, the race was on a, was it a Saturday or Sunday race? <laughs> It was a Saturday race. I know you're okay. going to make me think back to this. It was a Saturday race. And here's, okay, here's the really, really cool thing. We, um, we did get there the, a week before. So I okay. had plenty Makes of time yep. to get there. And it was, it was kind of all a blessing about how it worked out this year because in Klein ISD, we have a fall break. And so that whole week before Kona was our, our, fall break. And so I didn't have to miss any work or take any time off, you know, to travel. Oh, that's cool. Oh, it It was was meant to be. It was meant to be. Well, also on that too, like the actual race Kona, uh, was on October 14th and that is my birthday. So I got to, yeah, I got to race Kona on my birthday. So that's special. (laughs) Yeah. That is really special. Oh, um, so you got there a week early. Did you, were you guys staying in a hotel or an Airbnb? How does that work at the world championships? Yeah, we, I know there's different 
you know, ways you can go with that. And since the whole family went, uh, it was all of us, we, we stayed at a VRBO. So we just had a house and it was about 20 minutes North of Kona in, uh, the Waikola village. And so it's just, sounds awesome. Yeah, it's right up the Queen K. And so, you know, we had a whole house, all this area. It was it was really nice. Uh, My coach recommended that I do that. The rest of my friends all stayed in hotels that were right there in the heart of, you know, the start and finish line. Okay. So, and, and so I can see both ways, you know, some people are like, no, that's where I want to be right in the mix of things. But some people, and for some athletes, it's kind of nicer to be away from all of that. And you you know, stick your own routine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so I personally really enjoyed being away from, you know, the heart of the race start and finish line and, you know, Iron Man, you know, everything. And so it's kind of nice to just be there to take some deep breaths and, you know, be able to quietly reflect on my personal race and, and what I needed to do to prepare. I think that's a great, great choice. And it sounds absolutely lovely. Um, so, you know, I'm, odds are good that I will never be a competitor at the world championships. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. probably not. Probably not. Not that I'm never not capable, say never. but yes, not that I'm not capable, but the desire is lacking, but it, but it sounds amazing. And I'm curious the check-in at, at that event, right? What, what's it like? Was it like any other Ironman? Was it different? Um, what was that experience like when you had to go in and, and check in and register and drop your bike off and all that kind of stuff, right? Was it similar to the other ones you've done or different? It was pretty similar. I will say, um, you know, the initial check-in where it's like, okay, just, you know, kind of go and pick up your stuff, pick up your bib, you know, bibs and your numbers and your backpack and all of that. (laughs) There was, it was really organized and nobody, you know, no, not long lines. There weren't a bunch of athletes there because you have check-in times. So you select a check-in time and that's when you go, you know, to check in. And so it wasn't, you know, super crowded or busy or any of that. Now the bike check-in day. Yes. Like when you go, you know, drop off your bike again, same thing. You have check-in times that you pre-select. Uh, so it's not, you know, mass chaos. There's not a ton of people there dropping off, you know, you the bike and the bags and all of that. And it was so nice in the fact that, you know, of course the, the transition area is set up because this is the best of the best race, you know, you've got the, the Ironman carpet laid down, you know, where the bikes are and the bike racks are super nice. And, uh, then where you put your, when you're checking in your bike bag and your run bag, you know, it's actually up on hooks that are off the ground. You know, it's like this, almost like a nice little closet where it's all super organized and, and very nice compared to, you know, other races. It's like your, your run bag or your bike bag check in, you know, it's, it's on the ground. You just kind of lay it in order on the ground. (laughs) Um, so that was really cool. It was just kind of like next level world-class, uh, you know, transition area. Did you do the practice swim the day before? Oh yes. Well, I, I practice swam almost every single day of that week before the race. (laughs) Oh, that's good. Well, so what I've heard, right. And I've, I've, like I said, I've been to the Hawaiian islands. And when I'm, when the water's calm, it's very clear and very visible. So I, I can't imagine swimming out in the middle of some of those bays where you can see 20, 30, 40 feet below you and, you know, however far in front of you. Um, Was that your experience? Tell us about the water when you were doing these open water swims. What was it like? Because we know Lake Conroe is is exactly negative visibility. (laughs) (laughs) It was it was completely opposite of Lake Conroe. Yes, we will start there. Um, it, It was gorgeous. And I did start to get worried before the first swim because you know, the Pacific ocean is supposed to be very, very cold. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, I was like, Oh no, I can't handle another swim like Arizona. Like I just can't do it. Uh, but no, the water temperatures were, it was about 80 degrees. It was beautiful. So no wetsuit, no wetsuit. Yeah. No wetsuit, not allowed to have a wetsuit. Uh, so that, that is kind of a funny story. So I do have a swim skin, you know, you could wear a swim Mm -hmm. skin if you wanted to over your kit. Uh, so I, you know, I practiced in 
the swim skin and that was no problem. Uh, but I'll tell you a race day story in a minute on that. That was a big problem. Uh, but uh, no, the, it was gorgeous. Yes. Swimming out, you know, on the practice swims, you could see to the bottom. There were just beautiful coral reefs. You could see, you know, fish and different sea life, you know, just swimming around beneath you. So it was gorgeous. And then for the practice swims, they have uh, the Kona coffee boat. And it's so cool. Uh, the Kona coffee boat is set up about, I think it's about a thousand yards you know, out. Um, so you can swim out about a thousand yards and, you know, swim up to the side of the coffee boat and they'll just hand you like a little cup, you know, just a little shot of their coffee. You can sit there and hang onto the side of the boat or they throw out floaties and, you know, all the athletes. It's so cool. You're just kind of visiting with people and chit chatting. That sounds awesome. Absolutely. I was like, Hey, I could do this every day. This is great. <laughs> Yeah. So this is what open water swimming is supposed to be like. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. If it was like that every time, this would be great. No problem. Um, and so that was really good. I did. And I don't have a fear. I don't have a fear of the swim. I really don't. I'm, you know, a good swimmer. That's that part's fine. I, the day before the race though, did start having a lot of anxiety about the open water swim and then being, you know, 2000 yards away from the shore. And what scares me most about that, I guess the anxiety that started to kind of take over was the other swimmers, you know, Mm -hmm. I kind of started worrying, what if they freak out? What if they start to freak out and like, you know, grab onto me and something terrible happens. But, um, you know, that I had to put it out of my mind and just really on race day, you know, mind over matter, you know, I had to get my mind right. And, you know, just continue to pray through that swim and tell myself, like, just think positive thoughts and, um, just focus on my training and remember that, you know, physically I was there and I had a great swim, the swim. And I think I finished the swim in an hour and 14 minutes. So, that it's was fast. a great yeah. swim for me. It was super, you know, uh, it did get a little choppy, uh, on race day, about a thousand yards out, the chop definitely picked up and the waves, you know, kind of swimming with the waves. Uh, that was a, you know, not a fun feeling. And then of course, uh, the last thousand yards coming in, you know, I kind of talked about that viciousness and it was definitely, you were fighting for your spot. So, you know, that's when you're swimming with your elbows wide and kind of throwing bows <laughs> while you're swimming. <laughs> oh man. That's so, fun. It's so, it was, do you, when you come out of the water there, um, is it like Sandy kind of coming up on a beach or is it a different type of landing? No, it's a different kind of landing. Like you come, you came out of the water onto the dock. And so it was the entrance is like a little, you know, a a sandy entrance. But when you exit, you we came out onto the dock. So there were stairs. Okay. Very cool. Uh, so yeah, you swim up. But Man. the hard part is like you can't put your feet down, like even if there's a backup of swimmers because the coral reef is down there and you oh. don't want to stand on the coral. No. Uh, so it's you're like just trying. Yes. Yeah. Trying to like, you know, float or tread water until you make it to that the stairs and you have a you know, you can jump in there, but no, the, uh, with my swim skin, the zipper broke the, on my last practice swim, I've had this swim skin for two years, but, um, during the practice swim the day before the zipper broke and I like flipped out because I did not <laughs> want to race without my swim skin. Um, just, you know, almost like a mental thing. I knew sure. you can have your you know what? Practice like you play. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so the night before the race, yes, I had like scissors and, and I was YouTubing how to fix a zipper. And, um, you know, my family was, you know, Tim was not happy with me because he tried to, you know, fix it and couldn't. And I was all stressed. And <laughs> so and so did you get it? Did you get it fixed? So you, or did you swim without it? I did. No, I YouTubed a quick fix on how to fix a zipper and with a quick, you know, little cut of the scissors. And, you know, I, I rigged it so that it worked on race day. And, and then I took it to a tailor when I returned and she said, it's done. She can't fix it. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's awesome. All right. Good story there. That's yeah. good. All right. So you get out of the swim and now it's time for the bike. And this is a, what, a hundred and what was it? 112 or 114 miles. I'm 112, yeah. 112 miles of windy, hilly, hot 
lava fields. What? Yeah. <laughs> give us the low. Give us the lowdown. Was it? Was it better than that? Was it worse than that? Was it? You know, did it meet your expectations, or was it way harder? What? What do you think? Um, it was exactly that. I think it met my expectations because my training was during the hot summer months of Houston in Belleville on the hills. So I, you know, the training. Uh, 100% prepared me for, you know, the hills and the wind that were going to be there. Um, it also helps that uh, my my coach is a meteorologist, and I think uh, her specialty is coastal winds. So she had given me a pretty good, you know, insight and update into what to expect for the winds mm. that day. I know. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, day. that's pretty cool. So so Difficult. what was that report? How it described it? Like, give us the, the, the cliff notes version of the wind report. Uh, it was pretty much that, yes, it was, it was going to be bad. It was going to be strong and it was going to come from every angle. You know, there was going to be the wind coming off the coast. There was going to be a headwind and then there was going to be, I don't know what it's called, but there's some technical name when it's coming then at you from the land because of the way the wind comes off the coast. Okay. And hits. So it and was, was it, are we talking like direction. 15 to 20 or were, or were there gusts like 30? Uh, no, I think I was, we were lucky to, it was between that 15 and 25. Uh, okay. there was, there was nothing major, um, that I hit. So thank goodness on that. But I will say I, you know, you know, again, cycling is not my strong point. And in hindsight, I am, I know I could have had a better bike in Kona, but I, um, kind of let my mind get the best of me. And like you said, with that heat and the wind, I kind of got worried that I wasn't going to be able to get my nutrition in. And mainly because, you know, when you're cycling and having to take in your nutrition, you know, you're holding onto the bike sometimes with one hand so that you Mm -hmm. can get your nutrition. And with those winds and the hills, I didn't want to let go of my handles, you know, so any, anytime I needed to like actually get you know, a gel in or some actual nutrition, I had, I did stop. So I stopped often. I stopped at every single water station to make sure my bottles were full of water uh, because smart. That's I know, smart. but I just, in hindsight, I'm like, I, and my coach even joked, she was like, it was like you were out there for a Sunday afternoon ride. <laughs> I, I kind of laughed and I'm like, you know what? You're right. I felt like I was on a Sunday uh, afternoon ride. Like I, all of my training rides were much better than the actual race day ride. Yeah. But, um, you know, one piece of advice, it was like, just enjoy it. Enjoy every second. And, and I did on that bike ride, I was able to look out and you could just see the beautiful coastline, you know, just the blue waters and just the beauty of it all, uh, was so amazing. So I really am glad that I was able to take all that in. Now, let me, so technically on your bike, um, do you have any bladders? Like do you have a torpedo on the front in the, in your arrow position? Do you have, or are you just using water bottles? Oh no, I, I have that torpedo water bottle. Absolutely. With the straw. Cause that's okay. when I'm, you know, can't, you know, feel comfortable enough to let go of the handlebars and grab my water bottle. That's at least I'm getting, um, you know, hydration. Like I've got to be getting that water. And I use, uh, you asked earlier and I didn't answer, but I do use a uh, scratch as one of my main pieces of fuel okay. and so human gels and scratch. And so mm-hmm. with the scratch, I just, I mix that in my bottles and, um, and then that's what I continue to just add to my torpedo. Okay. Yeah. That's smart. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I've only done the one full, but I did it. Um, I geek out. I do a ton of research and talk to a ton of people and the way I had myself set up my Cervelo, Actually, I can put a, a bladder in the frame, um, not standard, but but I utilize a specialized bladder and an aftermarket component. And so I, I could have a bladder that goes into the frame. So I used a torpedo where I put my, I used infinite and I put my infinite nutrition in the torpedo. And then I had regular plain water in the frame bladder. And then I had uh, two bottles behind my seat. And so, and then I, I also had at the, the um I don't know, midpoint where of the bike where you could get so I just had more bottles. And so what I always did was just drank from the bladder so I didn't have to stop very often with it. You know, everything was hands free. Um 
So I don't know if with the Argon, if you have the ability to put a bladder in the, in the frame or not, but, or if you look at a new bike and uh, uh, something new, a different, there are several models, obviously where you can have a frame, a frame bladder as well as the handlebar bladder. Okay. Yeah. Like I'll have torpedo, to look into that. Cause I would you know. You know, yeah, it minimized, it minimized, um, the amount of needing to stop to refill. So yeah, anyways. absolutely. And that's, that's something important that, you know, I, I know about myself, so I should look into that to help out for sure. Yeah. And then you could also, you know, break arrow and just get a big camel back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. Bring my, bring my grand Canyon, uh, camel back. There we go. That's <laughs> it. That's it. All right. So you finally, you get, you, you, oh. now I want to ask you this about one last thing about the bike. Was it, was it harder going out? because it's a big loop, right? So it's harder going out or harder coming back. Oh man. It, I physically, I think going out was harder. Um, and then you have that, the, at the very end of the almost halfway point, you have that climb and it's called Javi. Um, and it's like a little town, you know, North of Kona. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, you know, it's halfway through the bike ride and then you turn around and Javi and, but there's a climb, the climb into Javi is like the steepest point. Mm. Um, and so that, that was really hard. And so once you turn around and you get to come back in there, there's a lot more downhill on the way back in. However, okay. that's also something I'm not comfortable in, you know? Okay. So we, um, and again, I feel like, um, you know, it might be important to clarify, you know, I keep talking about, the bike and I'm not that great of a cyclist, but I also, that stems from, I have a, a great fear of the bike. Um, and, and I, I've had a couple of people who are, who have been close to me in my life, you know, that I've known who had severe, you know, wrecks on their bike mm -hmm. and, um, lost their lives. And so I am very cautious, uh, as a cyclist and a rider. And I, it takes a lot mentally, um, to get over my fear of the bike. And so I think sometimes that fear just over takes, you know, overcomes and, yeah. you know, it's definitely a big mental game too. So it's like, I might have that physical component on it, but in the moment, then I get very fearful and that holds me back. So wow. yeah. that's pretty, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty awesome though. It obviously hasn't kept you from pursuing this and competing and you know, doing 112 miles, uh, in this event, not to mention all the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of miles you've ridden in training. So, you know, knowing you have that fear and I've known that, um, uh, but you're able to overcome it and, and keep it in its box, so to speak. So yes, it's good. Yeah. It's, that's a testament to who you are. Pretty awesome. awesome. But thanks, All right. Then, yeah. Then I finished that bike and then it was party time. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yes. And that's when I, when I get off the bike, I'm like, Oh no, it's the marathon. You gotta be kidding me. So you're, you're ready to go. Um, so tell us about the run. I mean, 26.2, I don't know much about the run course. I mean, is it, is, well, tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. No. So it's, uh, and that's so funny. So every time I come out of the bike transition, you know, anytime I'm you know off the bike, put on those running shoes, you know, visor on, here we go. I, the first thing I say to my family when I see them, you know, outside that transition area is it's time to party. Like, here we go. <laughs> And they, they know it's like smile on my face. It's time to party. Let's do this. And like you said, I know a lot of other athletes come out and they're like, Oh man, here we go. Like this sucks. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's hard. Oh, I know. But that's like, that's the best part. It's like the party has started. Let's do this. And so, <laughs> ah, I did. It was like, you know, I left, I started the run feeling great. And, uh, the first, I think six to seven miles, maybe that long, maybe not that much, maybe about five miles. There was a great crowd support because it was down there, you know, at the heart uh, of the start and finish line. So the streets were lined with people. It was great. Uh, you know, the, just the environment and the excitement, you know, keeps you going for sure. So I did, I was feeling great. I was moving a pretty good pace. I mean, I think I was, you know, just like a normal run and, I was doing really good 
And then the race, uh, I think it was about mile 16 or 17 is when I kind of really uh, kind of hit not a wall all the way, but just kind of really took a toll on me for a minute. But after that, you know, first seven ish miles, then you, you come out of, you know, the heart of Kona and you pop back onto the queen K. Uh, so the queen K is the highway that, you know, the bike ride is on and also a huge piece, um, of the run. And so once you hit the queen K, you're headed back, um, uphill uh, against the wind and in the blazing sun with no protection, you know, there's mm. no shade anywhere. You're just in the sun. And then in addition to that, you're back on the highway. So this is kind of what I was talking about when I said there wasn't any crowd support, like there, there is nobody out there standing on the highway <laughs> cheering for you to come by. And, and so that got really tough mentally, not only physically, but mentally like, okay, here it is, you know, and that the heat, the wind uphill, there's nobody out here supporting, like, it's just, it's just you and the road. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, like you said, I'm a good runner. This is my favorite part. And it was about mile 16 to 17. I just really going up the hill on the queen K it was like, okay, it's getting really hot. This is getting really hard. And so started to kind of slow down my pace. I knew it was t- taking a toll. And there were a couple of points that, you know, that 18 mile mark that I did, I had to like walk for a little bit. And that's not like me. I hate walking during that marathon. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that was, that kind of killed me, but there's this, um, it's called the energy lab and it's off the queen case. So you kind of turn into the energy lab and you run through this. Uh, it's maybe three or four miles. If I'm right, maybe it was five. Um, and you know, it's just kind of all through this little area and, uh, it shaded, it had more crowd support in there. So it was like, okay, this is good. This is good. Uh, so that kind of pepped me back up. And then I knew I don't drink soda. I'm not a soda drinker, but I've heard like, okay, if you're crashing, like get some Coke, you know, Coke Coke. is a miracle beverage when you're, that's what I heard. (laughs) It is. So of all my races, I've never, never stopped to drink Coke, but, um, I sure did. Uh, I took, you know, stopped and drank some Coke about mile 18 or 19 and, and then by 20, I was like, okay, I'm in the game again. Here we go. So headed back. Yeah, you know, simple sugar, man. It just I mean, uh, it gets into you quick. It was great. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, cruised back in and it did struggle a little bit through those, those final miles. Uh, just almost more disappointed with myself, I think, because I wasn't very happy with you know, the bike time and how that went. And then the fact that I was having to walk on some of the run was, you know, frustrating myself. Uh, but you know, I finished and when I, you know, you come back off the queen K into Kona, you know, you're, I think like a mile or two mile or two from the finish line. And so the crowd support picks up again and it's just, you know, that amazing excitement that just pushes you through. Cause you know, <laughs> Hey, I'm almost done. I almost finished, uh, you know, Kona, I just did this, you know, finished this course. It's amazing. Uh, so, you know, coming down that finish line was so great. And, you know, just hearing people cheer and knowing that my family was going to be down there somewhere was just truly amazing. So oh, now did they, do they still put a lay around your neck when you come across? They will not right away. You kind of, you finish and this, that was kind of the disappointing thing. I know, I think you asked me about missing Mike Riley and, you know, Mike Riley's year ended. I think when the, we did Arizona, the voice of Iron Man, Man right? Yes. The voice of Iron Man. He retired in 2022 at the end so he called us in in arizona which was so amazing right Uh um so yeah i'm I'm very curious to be what that was like crossing the finish line without him oh it was kind of (laughs) sad yeah i will say that well and it was sad because i i don't know who what her name is but it's the female announcer and um she actually didn't say my name at all 
So oh, no. it was, uh, how does that happen? Yeah, I know it was my birthday and I finished Kona and she didn't. So there was like oh. several people that came in. And so I wanted my friends and family that were on the side had said, I think there were like 10 to 12 people that she just kind of blanked on. And I don't know if she blanked because there were too many people coming through and she couldn't keep up or what happened. Yeah, it's uh, gotta be a tough, it's gotta be a tough job, right? I mean, uh, I, I've thought about what that's like and, and read this Mike Riley's book and he talks about that. And, you know, it was his personal mission to, to not miss anyone. But yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't imagine, imagine either. No, I can't imagine doing it, but he was amazing. Oh, my oh gosh. yeah. I'm I wouldn't want that... their job at all. But no, I was so sad. I was like, oh, that was kind of underwhelming. And that was sad. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So, about that. That's OK. But but it was awesome because yeah, then you're kind of led, you know, to the the finish tables or area, you know, of course they take you to medical if you need that, or they take you over to the finish tables. But when I got to the tables, you know, whatever, uh, I don't even remember my bib number now, but you know, their bib number, whatever. And so they're calling out so they can bring you your, your lay and your medal. But with me, it's like, they were like, Oh, this is number whatever. And then they all ran over there and they had a cupcake and the lay and they sang happy birthday to me. And that's it was, cool. It was really cool. So they made a huge deal of it. And so it, that was pretty awesome. Uh, but yes, you get the medal and you get the lay and it's, it's a very special finish for sure. Well, I've got to congratulate you on just, I mean, it's just an amazing accomplishment. You set you set that as a goal. I know you set it as a goal, and you achieved it. And um, just uh, just an unbelievable accomplishment. So, congratulations to you, Meredith. That's uh, not something that you can just take on lightly. That's a huge commitment, and you did it. Thank you. Yes, did it, and it it was truly amazing. So now I can say I yeah I tackled that one. <laughs> so, so when you look back on it, right? So it's roughly I don't know six eight months later at this uh, maybe maybe five months later at this point. What stands out most about the overall experience of training for and competing in that world championship event? Um, I think the most, the thing that is greatest to me is the fact of, you know, that my family and my friends supported me. Um, and no, like, cause I couldn't have done the, you know, finished all the training hours and the long days without a hundred percent also commitment from my family and friends, you know, my coworkers that supported me here, my kids who stepped up and helped around the house. And, you know, of course my husband who was helping me get all the workouts in by, by helping with the kids, <laughs> uh, and with things at home. So definitely just that community support stands out, uh, as well as just the friendships that were made. You know, the, the other women that I mentioned that were here going to Kona as well, you know, we trained together. We really got to know each other and just, you know, those friendships and connections, the, the training piece is, you know, 90% of it because you get to spend all your time getting to know these people and supporting each other and encouraging each other. And, and that is, that's what it's about. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, so, so what's next on the calendar for you? We talked about Boston that's coming up in April. So obviously I'm assuming that's on your calendar. That's what, on my calendar. What, what else do you have lined up for, for 2024? All right. So I have, um, I was going back and forth. I really, really wanted to do Texas again, you know, uh, full Ironman. I wanted to do that, but since it's one week after Boston, uh, my coach highly discouraged that. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not a good idea. I know, but I like, I wanted to do it so bad. So I'm really, I'm already having FOMO about not doing Texas this next year. Uh, but I did, uh, through to Team Zoot, I did win an entry to the Galveston Half Ironman, which is also in April. So I will be tackling and competing in my first half iron man um you'll love it you'll probably win yeah. you'll be fast oh, i'm so excited <laughs> yes you can use your speed you can go for it absolutely it'll just be fun i'll get to yeah like you said just go fast i can just speed through it all i love it um so that'll be interesting and that actually actually is one week before boston so <laughs> i'll yeah, have a good warm-up warm right yeah 
yeah, warm up before we get to, and Boston is just fun. So that'll be great. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what's for now. I really would like, um, a summer race. I would like a summer, either half Ironman or full Ironman, uh, just because I do love the heat and training in the summer is my favorite. So, okay. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Are you, do you intend to do a full in 24? Uh, there's nothing on the books, but I would sure love for there to be. So I, um, I would probably say, yes, that might happen. <laughs> okay. And then the one, one more, one more follow-up question is natural is, okay, you've been to the world championships. Is it a goal of yours to get back to the world championships again? Oh, goodness. Maybe not an immediate goal. Uh, if it were to happen, that would be great. And I would like to maybe go redeem myself on that bike. Uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of one of those, that was an amazing opportunity. I'm blessed to have been able to do that. And so, you know, if it doesn't happen again, that's okay. But you know, I haven't been to Nice, France yet. <laughs> okay. I like it. All right. I like the way you're thinking. That's cool. Very cool. I like it. All right. Um, well, I got it. First off, I've got to thank you. This has been an awesome insight into, you know, what you did, how you did it and, and what the experience was like, because so many of us will never get that opportunity. So Meredith, thanks for sharing that. Um, now I want to go beyond the whole Iron Man thing. Okay. And I want to ask you a question that I like to ask all of my guests. And that's, if you could go back to your, go back, you know, 20 or 30 years to give yourself advice. And I'd like to say, if you were talking to your 18 year old self, what advice would you give yourself just about life in general? Oh, that is a great question. I really, really like it. I, I mean, I think I would tell myself to, to go for it more, to, to let myself know that hard things are possible, um, regardless of your, you know, current age or, you know, ability that, um, hard things are possible and to really ask, um, you know, a question I asked now that I would ask myself then would be, um, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Uh, mm, something I like hard, that. Like, go for it. Yes. Yeah. So, cause there's, you know, if I would have started, you know, I think about that a lot running, you know, in high school or college, like what would that mean for me now? Wow. Or like what would have happened in my life? Uh, so just really, yeah. Encouraging myself, um, to, to know that hard things are possible. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Now we're going to go into our rapid fire brains and brawn segment. Uh, I'm obviously the brawn. That's my name. (laughs) And uh, you're the brains. So I'm going to ask you five quick questions and give me your answers. What is your favorite movie? Oh, uh, the holiday. (laughs) Total total chick flick. I love it. I haven't seen that. So that's probably good since it's a chick flick, but I may have to look (laughs) it up. All right. The holiday. Uh, what is your greatest accomplishment? Oh man, this is a hard one, but I, I truly feel my family is my greatest accomplishment. Um, good answer. My husband and my four beautiful and amazing children. That's what it's all about. What is a goal that you're still chasing? Ah, uh, so I'm still chasing, um, back to just my running dreams. Um, that sub three hour marathon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm really close. I close. I have a three ten from Chicago last year. So, um, I, I truly, that's on my mind and my heart sub three mar- marathon. I can do you it. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> okay. If you could spend the day with anyone past or present, who would that be? Uh, I would spend the day with my grandpa and, uh, it's my dad's dad. He passed away a couple of years ago and he is just truly amazing an amazing leader, very knowledgeable. And I would love to just go back and and spend the day with him and pick his brain and just sit and learn from him. (laughs) That's very cool. I like that. Okay. And where's your favorite place to travel or visit? Um, I haven't done a ton of traveling, but I absolutely love to go to the lake and we usually go to uh, a lake in Austin or around the Austin area every summer. And I just, I just love to be on the lake, on the boat, on the water. Um, it's truly my happy place. (laughs) A lake is never a bad place to be. That's a great choice. Great choice. Hey, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave with our audience? 
Um, I, I would, I want everybody to know, and I, you know, try to be positive in everything that I do, but just like I said a minute ago, know that hard things are possible and to never give up. Uh, and you know, if there's some goal in your mind, go for it. Like why, why not? This is your one life. You have one life to live. So why not, um, live it to the fullest and, and try those hard things and don't give up and do something scary and take a risk. I love that. Very well said. Meredith, I have to thank you again for this memorable conversation. I appreciate your insights and I'm sure our listeners will as well. If any of our listeners would like to connect with you, what are the best ways to do so? Oh, I, I'm on Instagram, Moss 4 running the number four, because I have four children. So, um, in Moss for running, I, you know, have a Facebook account and I'm all over Klein ISD. <laughs> Very good. That is awesome. Well, hopefully some folks will, will reach out to you and, and pick your brain. You've got a, a lot of wisdom to share. So thank you again. And well, that's a wrap for today's Brawny Conversations podcast. Special thanks to our guest, Meredith Moss. And I also want to thank each of you for choosing to listen to this podcast. New episodes are posted monthly. So please remember to follow us and let us help you shorten your learning curve. Have a great day, everyone. You have been listening to the Brawny Conversations podcast. Thank you for choosing to spend time with us today. And please subscribe to the podcast to receive our latest episodes and give us a follow on social media. New episodes are now in production and we can't wait to share them with you. Pursue your passions and help others along the way. Have a great day and thank you for listening.